For weeks following Tet, the Vietnamese Lunar New Year, Hanoi streets are relatively empty while people visit family and friends, say prayers to ancestors, and attend religious festivals. Here in Hanoi's ancient temple of literature, Vietnam's first university, an unusual festival draws a crowd of holiday visitors, many of them serious chess buffs. The event is the quarter and semi-finals of a game popular throughout northern Vietnam during the post-Tet festival season. Chess played on a tennis court sized board with human pieces. Following a procession of ladies dancing and offering prayers at the altar of the Temple of Literature, 16 young men in red and 16 young women in yellow walk ceremonially to their positions on the chessboard. Human chess is derived from Chinese chess, which has generals, mandarins, elephants, horses, artillery, carriages, and soldiers. Each young man or woman carries a Chinese standard telling which piece they are. The generals and mandarins wear hats and costumes appropriate to their rank. Two master players take the field with their chess armies. While pondering their next moves, the players are followed by young boys beating impatiently on small drums. The player's concentration is further tested by a singing narrator making humorous comments about the progress of the game and by an intent audience offering advice. The player points with a flag to where his piece should go. And taken pieces have to leave the field. Judges and kibitzers follow the game closely on a normal sized chessboard on the sidelines. Normal Chinese chess, the kind that's played on a board, came to Vietnam about the same time as the Temple of Literature was founded, roughly nine centuries ago. Initially, it was played for the king on special occasions because chess was an intellectual game. And then gradually it became a folk game. In the 16th century, human chess performances appeared for the first time in the villages. Human chess isn't merely played for entertainment. The Taoist opposition of the yin and yang are suggested by the men and women chess pieces. And the game itself celebrates the virtues of intellect, concentration, and doing one's best. Here amidst incense smoke and prayer, the human chess troupe meets some days later for the grand championship match. Part game, part theater, and part religious ceremony, this slow motion drama is held at a Hanoi temple dedicated to an appropriate religious figure. Zay Tick, the celestial king of chess. Quasar Kain, famous in Paris and New York as designer of the miniskirt, inflatable furniture, and the cube car, recently moved back to his native Vietnam, where he's envisioning much larger things. A whole new city, for example. Cyclist in white in the midst of city traffic isn't your ordinary Saigonese. He's Quasar Kain, inventor, designer, engineer, and enfant terrible of the 1960s and 70s Paris fashion scene. And that bike is no ordinary bike. It's the bamboo clet, a kind creation using bamboo with metal moving parts. The product of an eclectic imagination that's designed dresses with removable panels, a transparent car, monumental Parisian buildings, and a high-speed hovercraft, this bike is a prototype, produced in a small shop in Kain's Saigon backyard. Imitators have copied the idea and are now exporting bamboo bikes to Europe, but the ebullient Khan isn't worried. He's got larger projects in mind, like a bridge spanning the Saigon River and a brand new million-person city on the other bank. For years, Saigon city planners have wanted a bridge linking Ho Chi Minh's crowded downtown with the other bank of the Saigon River. But large ships use the river, and the bridge would have to let them pass. One solution would be a drawbridge, but this would jam traffic each time it opened. Another solution would be to build the bridge high enough, about 40 meters, so the ships could pass underneath. The 
the main problem is not the, the bridge, but the, the problem is uh, mainly the, the access ramp. And with an access ramp starting over here at 40 meters, it's going, going downtown half a mile you know, inside the city. With a, you, a ramp like this would really destroy part of the city. Recently, Kine caught the public's attention with an elegant solution, a spiral ramp rising on piers above the river itself. It came to me, I don't know how, but it came to me that the obvious solution is to use the river to cross the river. A little bit like Kung Fu, you know? You use the water to, to, to cross the water. And so why not build a kind of a spiral ramp like this, like where, where we are? It's like an island, a spiral going up to 40 meters to that and uh, just crossing over there. So the idea was simple. It takes some time to convince people. The bridge would land among these palm trees on the far bank and the spiral ramp the, would rise from the, the river itself. It's going to be joined to, in an access ramp to the, and the spiral is going to be built uh, exactly around that ship over here. But this is only part of Kine's vision for leapfrogging Saigon into the first rank of modern cities. He envisions the new bridge joining present-day Ho Chi Minh with a futuristic million-person city where high-rises would be linked high in the sky by walkways, bike paths, and elevators, making automobiles unnecessary. Offices and factories would be an elevator right away, as would be the surrounding natural environment. People can really live and work where, where they are. I think this is really could be the, the next step of the future. Now we, we have like 99% just to convince people. Uh, but in this country, I think, uh, I think it would be easier because uh, in a way it's a new country. Yeah. It looks an old country, but now people, after being shut out from, uh, from the world you know, for such a long time, I think they are literally open to, and it's a challenge. So you would have this may to sound to like pie in the sky, but Kine has already conferred uh, about his plans with Vietnam's highest government official, Prime Minister Vo Van Kiet. Kine's proposed 3D city will likely remain a designer's dream for the time being, but his spiral ramp bridge could well be chosen over its main competitor, a German drawbridge design. In the meantime, Quasar Kine is staying at ground level, dodging the 2D Saigon traffic on his bamboo clad. Although there's been a lot of talk about saving the whales in recent years, fishermen in one small town on the coast of Vietnam just gave thanks for being saved by whales. Fishermen in Cantine Village, on the coast about 60 kilometers southeast of Ho Chi Minh City, spend most of their year catching fish, fixing their boats, drying their catch, and maintaining their gear. One day a year, however, things change in Kang Tain. When the moon is full in the eighth lunar month, as it was this past weekend, the routines are broken as the people of Kang Tain put on a festival honoring whales. Thousands of visitors descend on the town to join the fishermen in offering prayers and gifts to the gentle leviathans. The whales are still hunted in some parts of the world. Here they're worshipped as protectors of seafaring people and rescuers of those in peril at sea. Priests in the town's temple to whales ring bells, and women burn incense before altars displaying the ribs and jawbone of a whale. The huge creature was given full funeral rites after it washed ashore some years ago. As the prayers continue, gifts of food are carried aboard the town's fishing vessels. Townspeople and visitors, many of them from Saigon and even more distant points in Vietnam, Jam the decks of Cantine's fishing boats. Scores of boats put to sea at the same time, jostling each other as they crowd the narrow channel heading for the open ocean.
Students sing songs. Families bring picnics. Women shade themselves from the sun with parasols. And the air is festive as more and more boats from nearby harbors join the flotilla several miles offshore. In the past, our ancestors would go far out to sea and wait until they saw some whales before they'd come back. But now we cannot do that because the authorities fear if we go out too far, it's dangerous for the people's lives. A special dragon boat carrying musicians, actors, lion dancers, and beautiful maidens has gone out earlier to respectfully invite the spirit of Grandfather Whale to come back and join the festivities in town. Food, spirit money, and incense are offered to the whale spirit that's now accompanying the flotilla. And the celebrating begins in earnest as the fleet circles the dragon boat. Back on shore, the festivities continue when the fleet returns. While some fishermen insist they know of sailors rescued by whales, others simply say they're glad to have a day of fun before another year of hard work. Increasingly tuned in youth culture of Vietnam, fashion is king. Magazine and TV images of the latest New York and Paris styles are studied closely and imitated widely. But one young Saigon designer has fashion ideas that are very homegrown and very much his own. It's hard to say if Le Minh Qua's creations are works of high conceptual art or a send-up of the pretensions of haute couture. But one thing is certain, they're original. And they're getting rave reviews both on the runway and in Vietnamese media. Using materials found throughout rural Vietnam, straw, bamboo strips, coconut leaves, and burlap sacks, Qua's designs poke fun at the haughty elegance and expensive materials of conventional high fashion. At the same time, his models look like walking embodiments of the spirit of the Vietnamese countryside. This came from baskets used for fishing. They have round things like this, and I cut them open and attached these other things to make supplemental parts of the design. Qua is a 24-year-old student of oil painting at Saigon's University of Fine Arts and his models are fellow art students studying painting, sculpture, and computer graphics. Many, many Earlier this year, they entered a nationwide student competition on the assigned topic of fashion. Though Qua hadn't designed clothes before, his outrageous entry stole the show, won the competition, and made news throughout Vietnam. When the show finished, I was so happy and excited. People were looking at me and shouting. I loved that moment. Quai was inspired to use commonplace Vietnamese materials while on a student camping trip. I saw a group making their tent out of bamboo and leaves. And then there was a bicycle made of bamboo too. So when I had to think of a new fashion design, I thought, why not make a fashion collection of these same materials? Qua's most recent show packed the auditorium at his university and attracted the international press. While he'll continue oil painting, he thinks the world is ready for the slyly humorous ethnic look of his bamboo and burlap fashions. Nonetheless, one of his models questions the practicality of wearing her outfit, including its breadbasket hat, to work. This is fashion for showing, something to entertain, and you cannot wear it on the street. But practicality has seldom been the hallmark of high fashion anywhere. And if entertainment's the real goal, Qua's work is world class. The man who rescued U.S. Senator John McCain from a Hanoi lake nearly 30 years ago realized the long-held dream last week. Oh my God, 29 years and we see each other again? 
In an emotional reunion, retired Vietnamese factory worker Mai Van An met in Hanoi last week with the former Navy pilot whose life he saved during the war. Mr. An, now 79, described how in October of 1967 he was eating lunch at his home next to Hanoi's Chuk Baik Lake. Suddenly, American fighter bombers shrieked low overhead, followed by a chaos of bombs, machine gun fire, rockets, and explosions. A plane was hit, and its pilot bailed out over the lake. I looked up to watch it as I was sitting in the shelter. I wanted to run out of the shelter, but the people there didn't agree. They said I'd die if I went out when the aircraft were shooting crazily like that. The bullets were falling like rain on the lake. Un's companions also said, let him die. Why bother saving him? But Un didn't listen. He jumped from the shelter, grabbed a large bamboo pole, and plunged into the lake. Four other American aircraft were coming down to look for him. But the Vietnamese guns were shooting so hard, the aircraft had to fly back up. McCain recalls being semi-conscious, with his leg and collarbone broken. He sank beneath the lake surface, and all unfound was his parachute. I held the bamboo under my armpit, grabbed the parachute and pulled it, and then I saw the head of the pilot popping up. When they reached the shore, unrescued McCain again, this time from an angry crowd who wanted to beat the pilot and push him back into the lake. While McCain suffered for the next five years as a POW in the Hanoi Hilton, some of Un's neighbors were angry with him for rescuing a hated American pilot moments after he'd been attacking them. I didn't hate him. When he was in the sky, he shot at us. But when he fell into the lake, he was in danger. I had to save him. How can you hate someone who's in a situation like that? McCain warmly thanked the man who rescued him and expressed pleasure at meeting him in happier circumstances. He is in very good health. I can tell that by the way he greeted me. <laughs> the American friend who arranged the reunion says that now, years later, Un sees a larger purpose for what he did that day in 1967. Sort of a Buddhist, uh, cyclical way of looking at things. He realizes that if McCain had died that day, uh, then he would not have been in the U.S. Senate to be a leader in bringing Vietnam and America back together again in friendship after all these years. Un sees another purpose as well. I'll tell you this, Mr. McCain was very lucky, and thanks to me, he had the chance to marry the beautiful wife he has today. <laughs> Hanoi is lucky as well. Today, Chukpak Lake's a place where fathers can take their daughters for Sunday outings, and most Hanoians are too young to recall what happened here 30 years ago. Americans are sometimes accused of being inward-looking and concerned only with what happens in their own country. Recently in Vietnam, the director of New York's offbeat La Mama Experimental Theater proved that some Americans are citizens of the whole world. Here in Hanoi, Ellen Stewart, known as La Mama to actors and audiences around the globe, just wrapped up three weeks of mounting the kind of internationally eclectic production that has become her trademark. At an outdoor amphitheater dedicated to traditional Vietnamese water puppetry, La Mama cooked up a delicious dramatic stew combining Russian ballet, Chinese-style opera, Greek tragedy, and La Mama written music sung by a chorus of Vietnamese water puppets. But La Mama's been crossing borders and boundaries since she founded her theater 36 years ago. Since we began in 1961. So, Korea, was the first international company to come to La Mama, and they came in 1962. We began playing outside of the United States ourselves in 1965. As well as crossing international borders, Stewart's production of the Greek myth Dionysius crossed boundaries between four different Vietnamese performing groups that had never previously worked together. The National Dance Theater, the Popular Opera, the Water Puppet Troupe, and the National Drama Theater. La Mama also pulled some of Vietnam's best-known performers into her eclectic production. 
Levi, who played Semele, the dancing girl who tempts fate by becoming lovers with the god Zeus, is one of Vietnam's favorite film stars, named Best Actress at this year's Vietnam Film Festival. Chan Tien, playing messenger to the gods, is another nationally famous cinema and stage star. It's no surprise that some of Vietnam's best actors chose to work with Stewart. A remarkable number of world-famous stars, including Robert De Niro, Billy Crystal, and Al Pacino, have appeared in past La Mama performances. Stewart's unorthodox production challenged the Vietnamese cast. In the beginning, we had so much difficulty. It was really hard. Not only with the language, but also with the fact that La Mama's working style is so unfamiliar to Vietnamese actors. But ultimately, Stewart's dramatic vision crystallized. In my opinion, nothing could have brought us together but love, and love for art. Though she's in her 70s, La Mama keeps pushing herself and her actors to break through the barriers that divide the human family. I think everybody in the world is the same person, and I love being with everybody. From Vietnam, La Mama flew to the Philippines to cook up yet another multicultural, boundary-crossing, theatrical extravaganza.